One, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good. Good morning, everybody. So let's get started with our first lecture of the day, which will be Thomas's last lecture about generalized symmetries. All right, thank you. OK, so um, we have a little bit of uh, cleanup to do from yesterday, and then we'll launch into the last topic of today's lecture, which will be looking at some non-abelian gauge theories and trying to see what we can say about them from the perspective that I've been adopting. But let me remind you that we were discussing still uh, QED, scalar QED. So U1 gauge theory with two flavors of charge 1 Higgs fields, which I call HI. I is a flavor index. And these have electric charge 1. And we said that this model has a global zero form symmetry, which is SO3, the SO3 flavor symmetry. And it also has a U1 magnetic one form symmetry. It has no electric one form symmetry because this thing has electric charge one. Okay. And the SO3 flavor symmetry is fractionalized on the H's, which transform projectively under SO3. And that led to an interesting anomaly whose 5D SPT looks like this I pi W2 of the SO3 bundle. If you turn on SO3 background gauge fields, cup the integer flux of the B field mod 2, which you learned from Greg yesterday in a lot of detail, is an integer cohomology class. So it can be reduced mod 2 and cupped with W2. So we studied this theory in the Coulomb phase, and that's where we developed this idea about the fractionalization. And then I turned on a Higgs potential for H, an SO3 symmetric Higgs potential to H, and that led to a VEV for H. And that had two effects. First of all, the U1 gauge symmetry is Higgs for nothing. And the SO3 symmetry is spontaneously broken to its carton, leading to a CP1 model for the Goldstone bosons. And this is, I think, where we left it. The fact that the, there's a mixed anomaly between SO3 and uh, the magnetic one form symmetry means that something interesting has to happen in each phase. And here the interesting thing is that the SO3 symmetry is spontaneously broken. Notice that the SO3 symmetry is not fractionalized on the low energy fields. The Goldstone bosons transform nicely under SO3. How is the anomaly matched in this phase? This is the last topic I want to discuss in this model before we move on. Um, let's see. So this is supposed to be a mixed anomaly between SO3 and the U1 one form symmetry. It's clear how the SO3 acts on the CP1 model. It's just the isometries of CP1. But it's not even completely obvious how we should think of the one form symmetry in the CP1 model. What has happened to it? The one form symmetry was the magnetic flux symmetry of the theory, so it came from a current, J magnetic, that was 1 over 2 pi times the field strength of the U1 connection. What happens to this field strength? 1 over 2 pi times this field strength, it flows to the volume form, to the Kähler form of the CP1 model under this Higgsing procedure pulled back to space-time using the CP1 fields. So this is a closed two-form in space-time. And that's the thing that represents the two-form current in the CP1 phase. So you see the CP1 model does have one-form symmetry. In fact, U1 one-form symmetry. And the way that the background field B couples to it is via wedging with the Kähler form of CP1 normalized so that it has periods in 
in Z, the way I've defined it, right? 1 over 2 pi fs periods in Z. Sorry, maybe I missed it. Yeah. How do you see that this is true? Well, you can do it explicitly if you want to. But uh, it is also the only closed two form in the low energy model. And well, the, the only closed two form in the low energy model it has a, a, a chance of having interesting charges when you integrate it. Because when you integrate this over two cycles in space time, it measures the winding number of the pion fields from that two cycle onto CP1. And those winding configurations, which sometimes you would call skirmions, are in this case skirmion strings that <coughs> represent the magnetic vortex strings of the theory in this phase. In the theory with only one Higgs field, we didn't have a low energy CP1 model and the vortex strings were there, but you couldn't, they didn't have any remnant in the low energy theory. Here the vortex strings actually show up as solitons in the low energy CP1 model. And this is just saying it's a magnetic monopole, essentially. No, it's not a monopole. It's co-dimension. It's, it's, it's a string. It's, it's, it's one dimensional in space. It would, right, because the, the CP1 is a two dimensional manifold. And the thing that you get by integrating this over some two cycle in space time is the winding number from the fields on that two cycle to CP1. So you should think of this two cycle as the, the transverse direction to the string. If you were in three dimensions, you would say this is a skirmion particle. In four dimensions, it's a string. Yeah. This is, in QCD, the, there are also skirmions, but they're skirmions of S3, which is three-dimensional. And therefore, they're point particles. And they're baryons. But here it's, here it's a string. OK. So this model, in fact, does couple to the B field. And because of what I told you here, I didn't check it for you explicitly, but you can check it. You know, it it's algebra. You, you literally just plug in, uh, and, and you'll find this result. Uh, because the anomaly was matched by the coupling of B magnetic wedge F, this anomaly matching will persist once we flow to the CP1 phase. So this is how that works. Now, because we are in a Higgs phase, um, the U1 magnetic symmetry is unbroken, right? So this is unbroken. And these charged skirmion strings are precisely the confining, or the, the magnetic vortex strings of the model. I think I already said that. Let's see, is there anything else I want to say about this model? Yeah? Yeah, you can check that. I think I, I mentioned that yesterday, and maybe you also heard it last week from Nadi. If you break SO3 to U1, this anomaly trivializes. So this is the, U, the U1 subgroup is anomaly free. Right. Other questions? OK. So on to today's topic. Um, I mean, I said it in the beginning, and I want to say it again now. The, primary motivation for these lectures and for talking about these kind of symmetries is not just to analyze weakly coupled abelian models that we can analyze anyway. These are weakly coupled models in 4D. You can study them reliably. You probably studied them in quantum field theory class in more detail than I discussed them here. The idea of going through these models is to prepare for an analysis of more interesting models. And you can make the models more interesting in many, many ways. One way of doing this is to take exactly the models that we've studied and go to three dimensions. In three dimensions, even U1 gauge theories are strongly coupled. And it's an interesting question what these models do there. And you can, there's a very similar story with the symmetries that can help you analyze those models. Instead, what I want to do is stay in four dimensions. We've been in four dimensions. And try to understand better uh, some things about non-abelian gauge dynamics in 4D. Right. Non-abelian gauge theory in 4D is a kind of primary motivation for many of us. So you know, QCD is famously a non-abelian gauge theory in 4D. It's an SU3 gauge theory with quarks and the fundamental. And I want to talk about some very simple examples and illustrate how the symmetries that we've been discussing 
come up in those examples and how the models, the abelian models that I've been telling you about, arise in certain cases as effective descriptions of confinement. Okay. So, well, so we're not going to study QCD. QCD is hard for two reasons. First of all, it's SU3, and the simplest gauge group that is not U1 is SU2, at least in my estimation. Um, and secondly, QCD has fundamental quarks. That makes the theory very interesting, but unfortunately, it also ruins its one-form symmetry. And that's a feature, that's not a bug. But we've been studying theories with one-form symmetry, and so I'm going to stay in that universe. Uh, so I'm going to add matter. But if I add matter, I'm going to add matter in the adjoint representation so as to preserve some one-form symmetry. That doesn't mean that we can't say anything about QCD. For example, this model. Right, this model didn't have an electric one-form symmetry, but somehow this fractionalization anomaly is reminiscent of what one learns from a one-form symmetry. So there's similar things you can do in QCD as well, at least in some cases. Um, okay, so let's start with the pure, pure SU2 gauge theory. If I have time at the end, I'll say something about SO3, or I might make some comments along the way, but I probably won't have time. So. We'll probably be discussing SU2 all the way. And this theory doesn't have too many interesting zero-form symmetries. It has time reversal if you don't add a theta angle. Uh, and it has Poincare invariance, of course, but that's about it. Um, now, I'm going to try to make a list of things we sort of think we know about this theory. Some of them are very precise, and some of them are more like lore. And if I'm misrepresenting the law, then other people can correct me. Um, so here's what we, a few things we, we think we know about this theory. And this comes from all over the place. You know, this is some kind of amalgam of things that you learn from lattice simulations, things that you learn by making analogies with higher values of n, uh, certain limits of the theory that might be better controlled, the large n limit, where you can say something maybe using holography or string theory, and certain supersymmetric examples which are not pure SU2, but are kind of closely related. And uh, we're going to spend some time later today discussing those supersymmetric models. All right. What happened? Ah, here's my, here's my list. So the first thing, um, let me just say that for those who know about the theta angle, I'm not adding a theta angle to this theory. Um, the first thing that we think is true is that the theory is gapped and trivial. In other words, no anomalies, no TQFT, no symmetry breaking, nothing. Just one vacuum, and it's completely empty and boring. However, this is a very th hard th thing to show. If you manage to show it, you'll get a lot of money. The only problem is that in order to get the money, you have to show it the level of rigor that you show high that you probably have to define what quantum field theory means mathematically on the way. So don't get too excited. Um, or maybe get excited and solve the problem. Now, just like Maxwell theory, this theory has interesting Wilson lines. It has lots of local operators as well. Those are very interesting. But let's focus on the Wilson lines. They're defined as all the Wilson lines that we've discussed are, as holonomies of the dynamical SU2 gauge field in some representation j. Here g is a half integer that measures the spin of the representation. And this, this is the usual path ordered exponential. And a here is the non-abelian SU2 gauge field viewed as a kind of, um, you know, I'm suppressing the adjoint indices or the Lie algebra indices here. And this represents the world line of a heavy pro particle in the spin j representation of SU2. So for example, a fundamental quark, a standard fundamental quark, would have j equals a half. But here I'm just viewing it as a pro quark, I'm adding it to the theory. And the theory, okay, so the theory is believed to confine via finite tension Flux tubes, electric flux tubes or strings. Okay. 
Now, the last statement is a slogan that I'm sure you've heard about. But given all the things that we've learned, we can make it much more precise. So let's consider a fundamental Wilson line. So I'll write as w a half. All the fields in the Young Mills theory are in the adjoint representation of SU2. There are no fields in the fundamental. So this Wilson line cannot end. Right? There's no operator I can stick on the end to terminate it in a gauge invariant way. It cannot be completely screened. By contrast, if you look at the adjoint Wilson line with spin 1, that can end, for example, on a field strength operator, which is also in the adjoint. So the adjoint representation can always be screened. This strongly suggests, correctly, it turns out, that this symmetry has a Z2 one-form symmetry, electric one-form symmetry acting on Wilson lines. It assigns a non-trivial sign to half integer spin lines and a trivial sign to integer spin ones. Just a small side comment. In any pure gauge theory, there's always an electric one-form symmetry associated with the center of the gauge group. Here, Z2 is the center of SU2. In U1, the center was U1, and there was a U1 one-form symmetry. So in SUN, it would be Zn. Very good. Now, we have learned that the appropriate background field for such a discrete Z2 one-form symmetry is a cohomology class, which I'll call dielectric 2, in the second cohomology with Z2 coefficients. So in order to describe the coupling of the theory to this background field, I somehow have to say something about how to couple the theory to such a cohomology class. So I'm not going to do that by writing an explicit formula coupling BE to the Young-Mills Lagrangian, but I'm going to tell you in words what, the, what turning on B does. Remember that we discussed yesterday at great length uh, the difference between SO3 bundles, well, at great length, I should say, at no, in no detail at all, <laughs> <laughs> the, the difference between SO3 bundles and SE2 bundles. Um, SO3 bundles have a topological class, W2, which lives in precisely this cohomology group. And when that class is non-trivial, they cannot be lifted to SU2 bundles. So just by matching all the indices, it's a natural guess that you should think of this as BE. Now, what do I mean by that? When BE is 0, when you turn off the background field, you're discussing vanilla SU2 gauge theory. So you just do the path integral over SU2 bundles with SU2 connections, modulo gauge transformations. That's what SU2 gauge theory means. And when you turn on this BE, this BE is a background field, right? So it's, it's a thing that you pick once and for all. It doesn't fluctuate. You don't path integrate over it. What does it mean to turn on this BE? It means that you do the path integral over SO3 gauge fields, even though you're in SU2 gauge theory. But you only path integrate over those SO3 gauge fields that have fixed W3. If you were doing honest to God SO3 gauge theory, you would sum over all W3s. But here you keep them fixed. OK? So this is the definition of what it means to study SU2 gauge theory coupled to this background field. Now, this is an example, a non-abelian example of a twisted gauge field. So the SU2 gauge field is kind of twisted into an SO3 gauge field by this BE. And we've seen examples of that in abelian gauge theory. Uh, this twisting, by the way, is also known as a Tuft flux. <coughs> it's kind of like a discrete magnetic flux. Very good. OK. so. This is nice. And under B gauge transformation, the fundamental Wilson line gets a minus sign, shifts, because it's charged under this one-form symmetry. Now, because the fundamental Wilson line is charged, it cannot break. And that means that when you act with it on the vacuum, it 
creates a string which has to be stable, cannot snap open and decay. Well, maybe I'll actually leave this up. Let's sort of refer to it later. So, W a half acting on the vacuum creates a stable string. And this is an electric string because we're acting with a Wilson line, which creates electric flux. So this is, this is an electric flux tube. And indeed, you, if you compute, and by com compute I mean whatever means you have available, for example, on the lattice, the expectation value of a large fundamental Wilson loop, you find an area law with a finite tension. So that means that this loop has zero expectation value, as we've said. And that means that the z to one form symmetry is unbroken. And remember, we've characterized confinement, even in abelian models, as unbroken electric one form symmetry. So this agrees with that. Equivalently, remember that area law translates into a linearly rising quark antiquark potential if you do a rectangular loop instead. And so this tension here is really the tension of the confining string that gives rise to the linearly rising potential. So for SU2, the, for pure SU2, really the only way we do, know this is from the lattice. Uh, right? Two is not large, so we can't use anything large and related. And, uh, but we'll see that we can get things like that in supersymmetric versions of the theory. All right. Any questions so far? Now, the one thing I want to draw your attention to is that this discussion of confinement as unbroken. Supposing, yeah. Supposing using some black magic, I could uh, prove that Z2 one form symmetry was unbroken. Would I then claim that I've proven confinement? Um, there, in, in this model, we should distinguish two things. And it's not completely clear to me if they're in one to one correspondence. One is a mass gap, and the other is confinement. Confinement is a very sharp statement, and it's tantamount to this. So I think if, you've pro if, you, if you prove this, then you've proven confinement in the sense that the Z2 form symmetry is unbroken. Okay, but supposing I have some magic tricks and I manage to prove rigorously that Z2 one form symmetry is unbroken, uh -huh. what, what, what can I conclude about the physics of this model? So, well, the only thing that you can literally conclude is this. The question is, how much, how much mileage does this buy you? Somehow what this is supposed to, I mean, what this really tells you is that. Would I actually conclude that there's an area low? I mean, how would I know it isn't? Oh, that's, an, that's a good question. Square. That's an excellent question, indeed. So, no, 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 you, but you didn't tell me the black magic. So your black magic doesn't involve this step. It just involves showing that this is 0. Yeah. Good. All, all so all you know, magic, all you learn from that. that so it, you know, my black magic says that the Z2 one form symmetry is unbroken. Yeah, which is equivalent to this. This, this is like a test for confinement, sort of looking at finite temperatures. We look to see whether the center symmetry is broken or unbroken. Right. But so, um, I think if you could prove that uh, center symmetry was unbroken, center symmetry, maybe it wouldn't satisfy Mr. No, but he's, ask, he's, he's asking whether, whether unbroken center symmetry automatically implies linear confinement, whether linear confinement is the only way to have unbroken center symmetry. And that's much less obvious. In fact, there, there, uh, but there, there, there are counterexamples, so one needs to be careful. We would like it to be true. But for example, if you look at Abelian gauge theory in 2 plus 1 dimensions, even pure Maxwell theory, it has a Coulombic confining potential an unbroken electric one-form symmetry. But it's not linearly confining. It's pure Coulomb. It's a log, right? Yeah, it's a log, exactly. It's not a linear. There's no string tension. But nevertheless, it confines. And the center, the center symmetry is unbroken. So in, in 40 gauge theories, this doesn't seem to happen. But I don't know how to prove it. That would be, really, that would be an excellent intermediate step. So, the, so it would be great if you could show that this implies finite tension, area law. 
And the second thing is, what's the relationship between unbroken center symmetry and mass gap? That's also not obvious. You might say, oh, well, obviously, if you have confining strings, then everything is confined. But that's not correct, because these confining strings only confine fundamental quarks. And there are no fundamental quarks. So what does that have, what does that have to do with mass gap? All right. So the, the good news is that not everything has been understood yet. There's still much to do. <laughs> um, all right. So the, the, the thing I want to draw your attention to, which we'll come back to shortly, is, of course, that we have discussed an example of a model that has a symmetry breaking pattern, like it's an electric one-form symmetry that is then unbroken. And that was the model of a uh, U1 abelian Higgs model, but with magnetic charge. And if you have magnetic charge, then you do not have a magnetic one-form symmetry, but you do have an electric one. And that one is unbroken in the Higgs phase. So there's a parallel between confinement, electric confinement, and magnetic Higgs. And I already mentioned that. And the question is whether this analogy is just a nice analogy, some nice words. These words were said by people long ago. Or whether there are models that actually make this relationship precise. In other words, models where confinement in a non-abelian gauge theory is somehow effectively described by such an abelian magnetic Higgs model. And indeed, this happens in certain supersymmetric versions of SU2 gauge theory, most famously the one with n equals 2 supersymmetry studied by Zyberg and Witten. And I'm going to spend the rest of today's lecture sketching out that story. So I'm going to move on to supersymmetry, unless there are questions about what I said just now. Yeah. Can you just uh, comment on the law that like, it is trivially gapped? Well, are you asking about the statement, or why people believe that? Yeah, I mean, is something you say that is not proved rigorously? It's not proved mathematically or analytically. I mean, if you do lattice simulations and you compute the spectrum of particles, you'll see that they're all gapped. The glue, the glue balls have a mass gap. So we definitely believe that this theory has a gap. OK. Good. So in order to make this analogy, I'm going to discuss the n equals 2 supersymmetric version of this theory. And then I'm going to break supersymmetry in various ways, either to n equals 1 or to n equals 0. And then we'll try to say something about confinement in those theories. As you'll see, the n equals 2 theory doesn't actually confine. You have to break n equals 2 to something in order to get confinement. All right, SU2, n equals 2, Susie Young-Mills. You've heard a little bit about supersymmetric young from Ken. And so I'm going to build on that. So what is this theory? What is the theory in the UV? This is a theory that has, in addition to gauge fields, there are SU2 gauge fields. And there are n equals 2 superpartners, which are gay genos. These are vial fermions. Alpha here is a doublet index. These are not Dirac fermions. And there's two of them. I is a label that labels the two gay genos. And then there's a complex scalar phi and its complex conjugate phi bar. All of these are in the adjoint representation of SU2. And I'm not going to go give you a systematic discussion of this theory, because that would take me many lectures. I'm just going to sketch sort of the important facts that we need. The first thing that we need is schematically how this Lagrangian looks like, very schematically. So they're roughly speaking kinetic terms, like the Young-Mills kinetic term and the fermion kinetic term, and the kinetic term for phi. And then there are Yukawas that look roughly like this, phi lambda lambda, that's complex conjugate. And there's an interesting and important scalar potential. And all the couplings are completely fixed by n equals to 2 supersymmetry in terms of a single number, which is the non-abelian gauge coupling g. And this g is asymptotically free. And therefore, it runs to strong coupling. This is why this theory is hard. 
just as Young knows is hard, and G transmutes into a dimensionful strong coupling scale, which I'll call big lambda. Now, what's the scalar potential? The scalar potential takes the following form, which is dictated by supersymmetry. It's 1 over g squared, trace, commutator of phi bar phi quantity squared. All right. Before I say something about what this theory does, let me make a list of important symmetries that it has. This theory, in addition to supersymmetry, has a whole bunch of important symmetries. And I want to list them. And then maybe I'll even leave them up. Well, I have room. So first of all, there is an SU2R symmetry. There's an SU2R symmetry under which the lambdas, the gay genos, are doublets. So the lambda, the lambda i is there in the fundamental of this SU2R symmetry. This is called an R symmetry because it also acts on the supercharges, but that will not be so important for me. Now, one thing that will be important for me is that the central element, minus 1, of this SU2R symmetry acts on the gay genos as minus 1. And the gay genos are the only thing in this Lagrangian that are charged under the SU2R, nothing else. So the fact that the central element of the SU2R acts on minus 1 means that it's identified with fermion number. All right. So the, the matrix minus 1 in SU2 is the same as minus 1 to the F. And that means that the global symmetry, the zero form symmetry of this model, is not SU2R times the Lorentz group. It's a quotient of that. So this model has fermions, right? The lambdas are fermions. So we, the Lorentz group is not SO4, it's spin 4. We're doing Euclidean Lorentz group still, but we have to pay attention to this. And there's the SU2R symmetry. And what this statement tells you is that those two are Z2 identified. So this model is both similar and different from the model over here. The model over here looked like it had an SU2 symmetry, and then actually the symmetry was the Z2 quotient that gave you SO3. And, and that was correct. Here, the, the SU2 symmetry is actually SU2. It's not secretly SO3. There are gauge invariant operators that transform in the fundamental of SU2. For example, the supercharges, which are doublets of SU2. However, this selection rule that all gauge invariant local operators that are doublets of SU2 are also fermions means that there is a Z2 quotient between the space-time symmetry and the SU2 symmetry. And this Z2 quotient it plays a very similar role to the Z2 quotient that gave us SO3 in this example, because it still implies the existence, if you study bundles of this symmetry, then there's still an interesting W2 class with coefficients in Z2 that measures the obstruction of lifting the, a bundle of G to a bundle of the direct product symmetry. And this W2 is an interesting background that you can turn on. So you can put this theory on manifolds that are not spin, even though the theory has fermions, as long as you simultaneously turn on an Etouf flux or the SU2R symmetry in a correlated way. And in such a situation, this W2 class is activated. So this W2 class is not, strictly speaking, W2 of the tangent bundle. It's W2 of this product bundle, or non-product bundle. All right. In a small comment for those of you who know, this is closely related to what happens in the context of topological twisting. When one topologically twists the theory to put it on a curved manifold, one correlates the SU2R background fields with the geometry of the manifold. And in particular, one has this global identification. But there, one also does something more sophisticated, because one picks the actual value for the connection to be correlated with the spin connection on the manifold to preserve some supersymmetry. We're not going to do that here, but this, uh, this global feature survives. All right. OK, so that's the SU2R. And there's also two more symmetries that I want to mention. 
One is a classical U1 axial symmetry, which acts by phases, both on the scalar field phi. Let me call it U1 axial. Sometimes people call it U1 little r in supersymmetry. This is a symmetry that acts by phases. And so I'm going to write the charges of the fields. Phi has r charge 2. The gauge eno has r charge 1. Of course, the gauge field is real and is uncharged. Now, because this symmetry rotates the fermions via phase, it's a standard axial symmetry from an ABJ anomaly, a triangle anomaly with the gauge fields. So quantum mechanics, this U1 is a fiction, and it's explicitly broken to Z8. Z8 is a com combination of the coefficient in the triangle diagram, which comes from the fermions in the loop, and the units in which the SU2 infantile numbers quantized. All right, so this E8 is a cyclic group. I'm going to write it like this. R is the generator of the group. And R acts by, on lambda by eighth roots of unity. And that means that R to the 4 is also minus 1 to the f. Yeah, good. This is this is multiplicative. Uh, this is charge Q bar, and this is the exponentiated generator. We won't need this because it's not a symmetry anyway. Very good. So the R to the fourth is also fermion number. There are lots of things that are fermion number in this theory, um, and in particular, it cannot be spontaneously broken. If you have a Lorentz invariant vacuum, then Fermi number is part of the spin 4 Lorentz group, and it cannot be spontaneously broken. You'll see that R is spontaneously broken, but R to the fourth is not. OK, very good. And so that was the Z1 axial. And then, of course, there is the Z2 electric one form symmetry, which survives because all the fields are adjoint. OK, any questions about the symmetries? Good, so let's try to discuss what this theory does in the infrared. A clue is the scalar potential that I wrote over there, which sets the commutator of phi and phi bar to 0. And this leads to a family of flat, connect, flat uh, directions that in some gauge you can write like this. So you can solve this condition with complex A. Uh, but the better and more gauge invariant way is to use the expectation value of some local gauge invariant operator. So you can use the operator trace phi squared. And it's related to this A to A squared. This U is a complex operator, and it's a chiral operator of the n equals 2 theory. So it's protected by supersymmetry. I think Ken told you about chiral operators. OK. And any value of a or u is allowed. So there is a moduli space of vacuum, which is just the complex plane The moduli space of vacua is the complex U plane. And literally just this. I'm going to draw some other things on there in a second. Now, one thing about U that I want to point out is this R is an eighth root of unity. Uh, and the phi field, which is related to U by phi squared, has charge 2 under it. So that means that R sends u to minus u. So that means the origin preserves this symmetry, but everywhere away from this origin, this symmetry is spontaneously broken, and it relates the points u and minus u. Good. Now, the amazing thing, which I'm going to spend absolutely no time explaining, is that using the power of n equals 2 supersymmetries, Iberg and Witten were able to give a completely explicit description of the low energy effective action everywhere in the U plane. 
This is a very beautiful story. And at generic points of the U-plane, so almost everywhere, all you have is a supersymmetric version of U1 Maxwell gauge theory. The thing that's complicated is that the electric and the theta angle of that theory are highly non-trivial functions of U, which they were able to determine, and which are crucial to many things. They're not going to be crucial in what I say today. So that means that generically, at generic points of this moduli space, the theory is in a Coulomb phase at long distances, just free Maxwell theory. The superpartners don't change that. So for this reason, the U-plane is also called the Coulomb branch. No, no, this is a global symmetry. The question was whether we should mod out by this uh, Z2 that sends u to minus u. The answer is no, this is not a gauge symmetry. This is a global symmetry. That's why it's a good idea to use u, because it's a gauge invariant. So you don't get confused about what you should mod out by. All right, so there are, um, oh, I, and I should say, because we're in the Coulomb phase, the one form symmetry, which is only two, dramatically enhances. We get the full U1 electric and U1 magnetic that we learned about in Maxwell theory. So that's an accidental symmetry. OK, so there are two special points on the Coulomb branch. At U equals lambda squared and minus lambda squared. You can pick units in which lambda is 1. And let me keep it there. Um, and they're exchanged by this broken symmetry. So the physics in these two points is the same. The same up to a subtlety, which I'll hopefully mention later. Let's, for, the, for, for, for this reason, focus on one of them. Let's focus on the right point, where u is positive. This is called the monopole point, for reasons that I'll now explain. Well, maybe, maybe I can erase this, and I'll just keep the upper board. So in order to explain why it's called the monopole points, I need to say one or two sentences about monopoles in this theory. Um, they're easiest to study way here at large vat. It's in a very weakly coupled Higgs phase, where SU2 is just Higgs to U1 by this vat. And in that kind of setting, where you have an SU2 gauge symmetry that's Higgs to U1, there are famously magnetic monopole solutions. Those are the Tov-Poyakov monopoles. And because of the supersymmetry in this theory, the solutions can actually be constructed exactly, and their properties can be described exactly. And what you find is that the monopoles, in particular the, the minimal monopole, with, electric with magnetic electric charge 0 and magnetic charge 1, is a very heavy object, which is described by a hypermultiplet. Of n equals 2, and that means that there are different states in the monopole multiplet. Some of them are bosons, and some of them are fermions. The hypermultiplet consists of a scalar doublet of SU2, that's what this I means, of magnetic charge 1, of course, and a direct fermion, which does not have any I indices, it's neutral under SU2, and it also has, of course, magnetic charge 1. So this is the monopole hypermultiplet. And the way you get these quantum numbers is by actually quantizing the uh, n equals 2 theory in the background of the monopole. And then you get fermion zero modes that attach themselves to the monopole. And they give these different quantum numbers. And at very weak coupling or far out on the u-plane, these monopoles are much heavier than the w bosons of the theory. Yeah. This is not a hypermultiplet field in the Lagrangian. This is a soliton. But this soliton is still in a representation of the supersymmetry algebra. It's a particle. And it's in a hypermultiplet representation. Now, you'll soon see that there'll be situations in which this soliton becomes light. And then it is appropriate to describe it by a field, which is exactly of this kind. But it'll be an emergent field. It's not, a, not something you put in in the UV. 
Very good. By the way, the fact that there are monopoles of charge one makes it obvious that this theory doesn't have any magnetic one-form symmetries, if you doubted that. Uh, and in fact, the monopole is part of an infinite family of dions that have even electric charge. It's the dion of electric charge zero. And the fact that the dions all have even charge is related to the fact that we have a Z2 electric one-form symmetry. So there better not be anything of electric charge one. Very good. Now, at weak coupling, and weak coupling means here, very far out on the U-plane, um, the monopole is super heavy compared to everything else. It's a soliton in a weakly coupled theory, which is heavy. Now, as you move in along the U-plane towards this point, supersymmetry allows you to compute the mass of the monopole exactly. And you find that it vanishes exactly at this point. So this is why this is called the monopole point. At this point, it has become lighter than everything else in the theory. The W bosons, for example, remain massive, but the monopole becomes massless. And clearly, it's a good idea then. No, it's not just a good idea, it's inevitable to include it in the low energy description, right? Otherwise, you get a singular description, which is not a good effective field theory description. So we're going to include this hypermultiplet, and we're going to write an effective Lagrange near the monopole point, which includes both the abelian gauge theory that was there everywhere and the massless monopole. So let's do that. Um, Now, the one caveat I will make is, of course, because this is a magnetic monopole, I'm going to write it in a duality frame where it looks like a standard electric charge. So I'm going to write an effective description for the monopole where I'm using the dual magnetic gauge field. Right. We already said these things in the non-supersymmetric abelian Higgs model. So what is the effective action near the monopole point? It includes a U1 gauge field, which will be the magnetic dual gauge field. So there's a magnetic U1 gauge field with field strength F tilde. Remember, if you've been using tildes for magnetic duals, this is related to the ordinary electric gauge field by star F. And its superpartners. Its superpartners include a complex scalar, which I'll call S, which is electrically neutral. In zyber quinton theory, it's usually called a dual, but I don't want to write a dual. And then there's a fermion, which will not play a role. And then there's the hypermultiplet, which I already wrote over there. So what is the Lagrangian for this theory near the, the monopole point? I'm just going to write the bosonic part. There's a Maxwell term for the dual gauge field with some dual gauge coupling E tilde. I'm going to raise this in a second. And then there is a kinetic term for H, which I'll write explicitly just to make it obvious how I'm coupling H. H couples to the magnetic dual gauge field A tilde with charge 1, because it's a monopole of charge 1. All right. Then there's an ordinary kinetic term for S, because it's uncharged. And then there are two interesting potential terms. There's a term S squared H squared. And then there's a term proportional to some constant times H to the fourth. This is the n equals 2 supersymmetric effective Lagrangian, at least the bosonic piece of it, near the monopole point. So here, plus fermions. This is the usual thing we do. Supersymmetry is a beautiful symmetry that relates bosons and fermions. And whenever we write Lagrangians, we don't write the fermions because they're messy. Good. Now, the scalar field S here, you see, doesn't have a potential. Right? If there's an S squared H squared, but S itself can have any expectation value. And the expectation value for S actually parametrizes the patch of the U-plane around the monopole point, right? There's, a, there's supposed to be a modulized space of vacuum everywhere here. And the field S is a modulus that does that. 
And the field S is related to U like this. U around the monopole point it's, is lambda squared plus a term that is order S plus terms that are S squared, S cubed. There's an infinite power series here in S with coefficients that Labrick and Witten computed. These higher order terms will not be important for us. So the monopole point is S equals 0. Right, because it's at u equals lambda squared. And that's good, because if you look at this Lagrangian, this s squared h squared term means that if s gets a VEV, h gets a mass, which is exactly s. And the monopole was supposed to be massless at the monopole point, which is therefore at s equals 0. Very good. Any questions? Now. This Lagrangian, if you ignore S for the moment, just the Lagrangian for F dual and for H, looks essentially identical to the Lagrangian I didn't write over here. So in other words, the abelian Higgs model for a doublet of H's of charge 1 coupled to a U1 gauge field. Only difference is that here I took the H's to have electric charge 1, and there I'm taking them to have magnetic charge 1. So everything we learned about this theory, its symmetries, its phases, the symmetry breaking patterns are all the same, except you have to exchange the words electric and magnetic. Do you have a question? Yeah, so, so H2 that's part of the yeah, that's a D term. That's the D term that prevents H from going on a Higgs branch. He killed the. He... Yes, I'm not writing that. I can, I can truncate very close to the monopole point, and then this is fine. Then all, all I'll get is the running of E, the logarithmic running of E induced by H. But sure, yes, absolutely. OK. So by switching the labels electric and magnetic, I'm going to copy everything we learned about this theory and apply it to this case. First of all, and that's already obvious, there's no magnetic symmetry because Q magnetic is 1 for the Higgs field, right? We have a monopole of charge 1. But we have what should be called an electric symmetry, a U1 electric symmetry. What is this U1 electric? It's the magnetic symmetry of the dual gauge field. It's the, it's the thing that is, measures magnetic fluxes of F dual, which are the same as electric fluxes of F. So we have a U1 electric one-form symmetry. And this U1 electric one-form symmetry is an accidental enhancement of the Z2 one-form symmetry that is present in the non-abelian theory. The breaking to Z2 is only visible if you go to higher energies, because there you see that there are massive W bosons, for example, that have electric charge 2, or massive dions that have electric charge 2, but then they're massive at the monopole point. So as we discussed yesterday, you don't see them in the effect of Lagrangian. And this formula is still up. This theory has a non-trivial Toft anomaly between what there should be called the U1 electric and the non-trivial W2 class of the symmetry. I unfortunately, it was erased. Um, right. So remember that the whole theory, including the abelian Higgs model, has a spin for times SU2R mod Z2 symmetry. And there's a non-trivial W2 class for that symmetry, which plays the role of this W2 of SO3. So the anomaly looks exactly the same. This model has this anomaly, has this fractionalization anomaly. So anomaly was actually first observed by Witten in the study of topological twisting and zyberg witten invariance. And I think then studied by Gregg and, and Witten as well. All right. So this is what I wanted to symmetries. Oh, I wanted to say one more important sentence. We, we, uh, the, the reason for this anomaly, just as it was the reason in the other model, is because the monopole has fractionalized quantum numbers under this global symmetry. Right? Things that do not transform projectively under the symmetry have correlated spin and SU2R representation. So an SU2R doublet has to be a fermion. Right? Here. I told you that the 
monopole hypermultiplet had a scalar that was a doublet and a fermion that was not a doublet. So this violates this selection rule. That means it's in a projective representation of this G, G symmetry. And as we learned, that can lead to an anomaly of this kind, and this fractionalization anomaly. All right. Yes? The what? The Z8 symmetry is spontaneously broken because we are at this point on the Coulomb branch where u is non-zero. It's spontaneously broken to a Z4 subgroup. Yeah, the other point is this point, which is called the diode point. And the broke, you can use the broken ZA to relate these points, right? And because it's a broken symmetry, that means the physics at these two points is completely identical. It doesn't look identical because the particle that becomes light there is a dion of electric charge 2 and magnetic charge 1. And here it's a pure monopole with electric charge 0. And there is an important global distinction between them, because if you bring them together and you compare them, you'll find that they are mutually non-local. So there's never a duality frame in which they look purely electric together. But individually, there's always a duality frame in which they look purely electric. So the effective model that describes the dion point is completely identical to the one I wrote. There's one important subtlety, which I may or may not have time for. So if I don't mention it, then you can ask me about it. So far, I'm working in flat space, and I haven't turned on any background fields. So, so I have a, a comment on a question. So if I were to turn on a metric, then there would be uh, a, comp uh, a coupling to the Euler character and the signature. But you would probably say something about A and C. Uh, yes, sure. And, um, those can be computed in kind of a roundabout way, those couplings. Right. Or not. My question to you is, uh, is, is that useful? It's not going to be useful for anything I'll say here, but it is useful for something, and I'll tell you why. Because um, th these are um, n equals two protected supersymmetric terms that involve the background supergravity fields, yes. the background metric and its superpartners. Yes. The when I study supersymmetry breaking, which I'll do in three seconds, I'm going to turn on some supersymmetry breaking masses, and in flat space they just look like some masses. But some of those masses actually reside in the supergravity multiplet. In other words, there are VEVs for scalars in the supergravity multiplet. So if you can compute those terms, then you can, which are higher order, they're derivative terms, you can study SUSY breaking to higher order. Because usually you can just study SUSY breaking at small m, where you're kind of close to the supersymmetric theory. And this allows you to go a little bit further. This has never been done in any non-trivial example, but I think it can be done. Oh, yes, we, should we should talk about it. For example, one could use it to study better the SUSY breaking of, say, an Argyris Douglas theory or something. OK. Sounds good. We'll do all of the non-supersymmetric gauge dynamics in 15 minutes. Um, so in the n this will probably suffice. The n equals 2 theory, you see, has a, a feature that the monopole mass is always positive. So it's never in the Higgs squared, the Higgs squared, the Higgs phase. Um, so the question is, can we do something to the non-abelian gauge theory to drive it into a Higgs phase for this H? And we learned in this model that a Higgs phase for this H would be a confining phase, because it would be a phase in which this Z2 electric is unbroken. The answer is yes, you can do that, but you have to break supersymmetry, at least a little. You cannot do it in the n equals 2 theory. And there are two scenarios that I want to outline. The first one breaks supersymmetry completely, but it has the good feature of preserving the SU2R symmetry which is nice because it involves this anomaly and so forth. The second scenario involves breaking n equals 2 to n equals 1. That's the one that Zyberk and Witten originally studied. So I'm going to discuss them in this order. Okay, so now that I've made my point about this model, I can erase. Let's do scenario one. In scenario one, we would like to break n equals two, two supersymmetry to n equals zero, in other words, to nothing, by adding to the Lagrangian a term m squared trace 
mod phi squared. This is a non-holomorphic mass term for phi. This is done in the UV, in the UV non-abelian gauge theory. And when this mass is very large, you can integrate out phi, and you're left with a non-supersymmetric gauge theory, which is SU2 gauge theory, with two adjoint quarks. That's an interesting cousin of QCD. It's not exactly QCD, but it's, it's not you know, miles away. And in that non-supersymmetric language, you would say that the SU2R symmetry of the supersymmetric theory is like a chiral symmetry for this QCD-like theory. All right. The nice thing is that it has still the one-form symmetry, which we've been using all around. OK, that's good. This is a lovely operator. It's not holomorphic. So you might worry, justifiably, that we are going to lose all control because supersymmetry protects holomorphic things. But this operator is very special, in, 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 in fact, special in the way that I just mentioned to Greg. This operator is a super partner of the stress tensor. If you act with two Qs and two Q bars on this operator trace phi squared, then you get the stress tensor of the theory, which is a conserved current and sits in a short multiplet of supersymmetry and can be tracked reliably from the UV to the IR. All right? In other, and that means that this operator, this mass term, is a supergravity background field. That's what I mentioned to you. Uh, but we won't, we won't use that. OK. Because of this relation to the stress tensor, and because Seibrick and Witten gave you a super detailed description of the low energy effective theory, which we need to use, you can actually map this operator to the entire Coulomb branch. And there's an interesting story what happens in the Coulomb branch. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what happens near the monopole and the dion points. And you can track it there. And what you find is that it flows through in the IR. And by IR, I mean at the monopole point. To m squared lambda, the imaginary part of s, plus a positive mass term for s, plus a negative term for h. That follows from supersymmetry in an unexpectedly nice way. So this mass looks good. And it suggests that if we take m to be very large, then h will indeed condense, get a vacuum expectation value, and the theory will confine. There's a small comment here. This mass term for s is nice, but there's also a tadpole for s, and that actually complicates the story a tiny bit. It means that if the mass m is small compared to lambda, the tadpole actually pushes you away from the monopole point, and h is 0. So you have to dial up m to be rather large of order lambda until you make a phase transition to this phase where h has a non-trivial value. So actually, the, the, the physics as a function of m is not smooth. At small m, you're still in the Coulomb phase. And then there's a phase transition to the Higgs phase where h condenses. And the, the critical m is of order lambda. So we have to go rather far from the supersymmetric limit that is the most controlled. That's why going to higher order in m would be a good idea if we could do it. Now, once this h condenses, we just play back all the things we learned about the CP1 model that we engineered in the Higgs phase of QED with two scalars. Right? When this H condenses, the gauge field is Higgs. You get confinement because you have the vortex strings. And the SU2R symmetry, which is the chiral symmetry in this model, is broken to U1. And you get pions. The, the CP1 model describes, describes the pions. And in fact, you can show, using supersymmetry, that the operator lambda i lambda j, which is the standard kind of quark bilinear that you would expect to condense in chiral symmetry breaking flows to h i h j. So it's non-zero when h gets a f. And the z2 electric symmetry is unbroken in the Higgs phase or in the magnetic Higgs phase. So we get confinement. And note that this is the story at the monopole point. But because of the broken z8, you also get an identical copy of this story at the dion point. So it's like the moduli, the space of vacuum of this theory is funny. It has two components. There's a CP1 over, every, over the monopole point and a different CP1 over the dion point. And they're exchanged by the broken z8. And in each CP1 sector, you break SU2 to its carton. So this is a disconnected pion. Uh, 
target space, which is not what you have in QCD. Yeah. So, if I think about the last fermions, there's a session two with one. One adjoint Dirac. One adjoint Dirac fermion. That's an interesting theory. I completely agree. And you know, it might not be. It's on the boundary. Of being conformal. Uh, Pe people discuss. I know that for sure for NF for two Dirac fermions, people for sure. But this one is this one is interesting and the well I'm giving you evidence that it's confining. I'm giving you a mechanism which is beyond the strictly controlled regime of supersymmetry that suggests that it is confining in chiral symmetry work. And I would be delighted if somebody could go and Yeah, I know it's hard. So if we have time afterwards I'd be happy to chat. All right. So let's, let's do all of n equals 1 in the remaining time. And I probably won't have time to say anything about the dion and the oblique confinement. Yeah, in fact, I just said that to Tom, because the, 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 this scenario is nice, and you, know, you might find it compelling. But because, because of this, because you have to go very far away from the supersymmetric regime, of course, it's not rigorous. Um, now, a much more controlled and much more rigor rigorous story, but a very similar one, appears if you do what Zyberk and Witten did, which is they also broke supersymmetry, but not to n equals 0. They broke it to n equals 1. And what they did is, so let me tell you case 2. Case 2 is n equals 2 to n equals 1. They didn't add this operator. They added the operator trace phi bar phi plus a mass for one of the two fermions plus its complex conjugate. This is a superpotential mass term. for the n equals 1 chiral adjoint that, is, that contains the scalar phi. If you decompose the n equals 2 vector multiple into 2 n equals 1, you get a vector multiple in the chiral. And this is a superpotential mass term. In other words, w is m trace phi squared, which is mu. And I told you u was a chiral operator. If you expand it out in components, it gives mass m to one of the two lambdas and to phi. And again, when m is very big, then you can integrate out these two fields, and you're left with SU2 gauge theory with only one adjoint fermion, and that's n equals 1 pure Suzy Young Mills, where the remaining lambda 2 fermion, which remains massless, is the gauge genome of the n equals to 1 theory. Now, I have enough time to not cut corners here. When you add this deformation, you see that you break the Z8 because lambda was charged under it. But remember that lambda transforms by an eighth root of unity, and lambda also transforms under the SU2R symmetry. So you can define a generator lambda tilde, which is R, multiplied by the SU2 matrix. My SU2 matrix, I'm pretty sure I remember my SU2 matrix. I don't want to screw up now. E to the minus i pi over 4 and e to the plus i pi over 4. Right. So this is a pi over 4 rotation in the sigma z direction of SU2 combined with r. And what does this do? Well, on lambda 1, which is the term we're actually adding to the Lagrangian, the effect of r and this e to the minus i pi over 4 cancel. So this is a, this is a symmetry of the deformed n equals 1 theory. And on the other gauge genome, the one re that remains massless, the, the lambda 2, R tilde acts non-trivially. So R tilde becomes the discrete R symmetry of the pure n equals 1 Susie Young Mills theory, R tilde on gauge genome number 2, which is the n equals 1 gauge genome. That is I times lambda 2 because the eighth roots of unity multiply to give you an i. And so this means that r tilde is actually a z4 symmetry. Because 
I to the fourth is one. And R squared is a fermion number, so that thing remains unbroken. And what you probably learned from Ken is that in n equals to one pure Suzy Yang Mills, the gauge genome bilinear trace lambda squared, which I'll write as lambda two lambda two in my language, gets a VEV proportional to the strong coupling scale cubed. And this spontaneously breaks this Z4 tilde symmetry to fermion number, to its Z2 subgroup. That's the story in n equals one. Let's see how you get this story by taking this deformation and applying it to the effective Lagrangian at the monopole point. Now, this operator, U, is actually a chiral operator. So it also can be tracked reliably to the monopole point. In fact, I already wrote down what it is near the monopole point. It's a constant plus s plus other things. OK? So adding this to the superpotential, let me write for you the superpotential at the monopole point in n equals 1 superpotential language. Here I've written the actual component Lagrangian. But the n equals 1 superpotential at the monopole point is, first of all, m times this s. That comes from the uv. There are also higher order terms in s, which we won't need. Right? This in, in the uv, you add m times u. So you add m times this entire power series to the superpotential, but only the leading term will matter. And then this scalar potential of the n equals 2 theory can be written in, in superpotential form in the following way. It's s times h1 times h2 bar. And it looks funny to write something with a bar in the superpotential, but in fact, h1 and h2 bar are chiral fields. h2 is an antichiral field, so that h bar can appear in the superpotential. And that's good because this is actually the gauge invariant combination. Now, you might, or hopefully, learn from Ken that in order to find the supersymmetric vacua, you should take the first derivatives of w with respect to the fields and set them to 0. So let's do that. Let's first, first take the derivative with respect to h and h bar. That just gives you s. And that means that s has to be 0 in a supersymmetric vacuum. And the derivative with respect to s gets rid of this and tells you that h h bar has to be m, and in particular, non-zero. Therefore, also in this scenario, h gets a VEV, and you are in a magnetic Higgs phase, and you get confinement. The only thing you don't get is the CP1, because the SU2 symmetry has been completely broken. Right? This mass term here breaks the SU2 symmetry. Only this discrete Z4 survives. And therefore, there are no Goldstone bosons. You just get one trivially gapped vacuum at the monopole point, and its Z4 partner, which is the trivially gapped vacuum at the dion point. And those are the only two supersymmetric vacuum of the n equals 1 theory. And in fact, that matches the fact that the, that theory has Witten index 2. So this description of confinement in n equals to 1 is very similar to the one I gave in the non-supersymmetric theory with adjoints, but it's better in many respects. Uh, at least two which I want to highlight. First of all, in this theory, confinement sets in even for infinitesimally small m. The moment m is non-zero, h condenses, and you are in the confining or magnetic Higgs space. By contrast, in the other case, I have to dial up m to be of order the strong coupling scale to jump into that phase. And the other thing is that here, because of supersymmetry and the holomorphy of the superpotential and the parameter m, you can argue convincingly that there shouldn't be any phase transition as a function of m. So you can make m very large and then reach the decoupling limit where you're really describing the pure n equals 1 Susie Yang Mills theory. And you will not be in a different phase, at least. The, the, the details of the microscopic physics and the heavy states will change, but you will remain in the confining phase throughout. I have one more minute. That's all I need to tell you what happens when you flow from this theory to pure SU2 Yang Mills. 
you can flow from this theory to pure SU2 Young Mills without any fermions by also giving this guy a mass so that you break supersymmetry again. What happens when you give the, this guy a mass? You, you get pure SU2 gauge theory, and the phase of this mass is related to the theta angle of the SU2 theory. And for most values of this phase, you learn that either one of the vacua or the other of the n equals to 1 theory is the, the one with lower energy. However, there's an accident that happens precisely when theta equals to pi, which is that these two vacua remain doubly degenerate. And that's something that doesn't just follow by some supersymmetry magic. It's actually protected by an anomaly. You might have heard about anomalies at theta equals to pi from other people. So I think this is a good place to stop. Well, the string corresponding to the, the fundamental string, so the string corresponding to the Wilson line in the fundamental representation of SU2 is protected by the exact Z2 one form symmetry, which is microscopically exact. So this string is completely stable and will never break. The other strings, so the, the abelian Higgs model has strings of any vorticity. And those, the ones of higher vorticity are not stable. They will eventually break. And the ones of even vorticity will be completely screened. And the ones of odd vorticity will be screened down to the fundamental string. So that if you could compute a large Wilson loop in any odd spin, odd integer spin representation, it will kind of look at long distances like the half integer, with the, 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 sorry, the, the spin a half fundamental loop. Yeah. Yeah. How much would the story change if instead of SU2, we did SU2M? SU what? Just SU even. You could also do SU odd. It's also interesting. Well, the, re the reason I specified even is because we had the Z2 that we were dealing with a lot of the time. The Z2 had nothing to do with the gauge group. The Z2 has something to do with the SU2R symmetry. So you can do the SUN yes. version of this. And it's very interesting and very rich. And many of the same things happen, but also many more things. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? All right, well, this is the end of Thomas's lecture series. Let's give him another big round of applause for his very nice lectures. So now we'll take another break, and then we'll meet back at 2 p.m. for our last lecture of the day with Greg Moore.